what does it take to become a dynasty? On today's show, I'm looking at why the Rangers have what it takes to become a dynasty and have all the makings of a long, long run of dominance after their first championship. All that and more on this episode of Locked On Rangers. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Rangers, your daily Texas Rangers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are locked onto the World Series champion Texas Rangers. I'm Bryce Patrick, a cripplingly addicted Texas Rangers fan covering this team for 11 seasons, including all six as the founder and host of this podcast. Thank you all so much for making this your Locked On Rangers your first listen every single day. If you're not already, you can follow me on Twitter at Bryce Patrick. You can follow the show at Locked On Rangers. Hit subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform and on YouTube, where the best way you can help grow the show is to comment nearly any single thing below. Today is Thursday, March 28th. It's opening day. We've finally made it, y'all. The day that the Rangers unveil their banner as the reigning World Series champs, the first in their history. But are there more championships on the way? I think there just might be. Now, on today's show, I wanted to break down what goes into a dynasty. I talked about it briefly on last Friday's show, but I wanted to look more, a little more in depth, gauge some public opinion, and kind of look at what the last few dynasties in baseball have been and, and how the Rangers might emulate them and spoiler alert the rangers already have a a pretty good lead on establishing a dynasty with championship number one in 2023 now how would you define a dynasty for me i think it has to start with at least three championships three legitimate championships and the the moniker that i kept getting the the refrain i kept getting from from people on twitter when i asked this question was was three championships in five years or something Along that lines, and and the one answer that I thought was was most helpful was just a, a period of time where you win more championships than you don't. And so the three and five moniker, I, I use that as kind of a baseline. And just looking at how many dynasties have there been in major sports in my lifetime, and I'm 30 years old, so use that as a pretty pretty decent barometer. And if you look at Major League Baseball, there have been two dynasties in my lifetime. One was the New York Yankees from 96 to 2000 when they won four championships in a five-year span. And then the Giants from 2010 to 2014. And if we're going three rings as the barometer in a five-year span or a you know, shorter span or even a little bit longer span than that, that's, that's pretty much it. That's, that's about all we got because two rings is not a dynasty. Back-to-back is not a dynasty. At, at the University of Alabama, when... Coach Saban was was getting his first couple of rings. There was no dynasty talk allowed, but until that third ring in four years, then then the word dynasty was allowed. You want to look at other sports in the last thirty years. There have not been a lot of dynasties there either. In the NFL, you had well, we were, we're expanding it to thirty one years, just so I can count the Cowboys as a dynasty from thirty ninety three to ninety six. The Patriots from two thousand two to two thousand five. Also, the Patriots from two thousand fifteen to two thousand nineteen, and the Kansas City Chiefs from twenty twenty to this year. You look at the NBA. You had the Bulls three peat. You had the Lakers three peat. You had the Spurs from o three to o seven. You had the Warriors from two thousand fifteen to two thousand eighteen. There have been none in the NHL. And in college football, the only dynasty has been Alabama from 2009 to 2012, if you are counting by the three and five year rule. That's not a lot. That's really not a lot in Major League Baseball. And some people even look at that Giants dynasty, Giants dynasty and say, eh, I don't know, they didn't make the playoffs in between those years. And, and right afterwards, everything's kind of fell apart. But I feel like three and five, you get three and five years. It doesn't matter how you got there, what happened in between or afterwards. That's for sure a dynasty. And some of the things that these teams had in common, I looked at some other, the most successful teams of winning championships the last you know, 20, 30 years in Major League Baseball. I counted the, the Cardinals and, and the Red Sox because both those teams have won a lot. Red Sox won four championships since the year 2004, and they won them in a, what, 14, 15-year span from 2004 to 2018 was their most recent championship. And they, they all have, you know, they all did it in different ways, but they had a few things in common. The, the number one thing that they had was a gro- homegrown star of these four teams that have won the most championships and been generally some of the most successful franchises of the last 30 years. They, they all had homegrown superstars. 
Yankees had Jeter. <sighs> of course they did. And of course, the St. Louis Cardinals had Albert Pujols. They also had Yadi Molina, uh, but Pujols is the main one. Dustin Pedroia for the Red Sox. And of course, Buster Posey for the Giants. Now, we'll get to where the Rangers check these off later on. They got to nail the big signings, though. All these teams have to nail their big signings, their big moves, big free agents, whatever. The Yankees had Daryl Strawberry. The Cardinals had Matt Holliday. The Red Sox had Manny Ramirez. The Giants didn't really have much of that. But basically, you have to nail those big old signings, those big trades. You cannot have a big old swing and a miss, a albatross contract. That is not really possible when you're trying to form a dynasty, unless you're just like going to spend your way out of it with being the by being the Yankees. Sometimes that happens. And then they also have to have generational managers. The Yankees had Joe Torre. The Cardinals had Tony La Russa. The Red Sox had Terry Francona. And, well, the Giants had Bruce Bochy. But that seems like a pretty winning formula. And then the last thing that these teams had, they had at least one pretty darn good homegrown pitcher. Andy Pettit, Jaime Garcia, John Lester. And, of course, the Giants had the the triplets of Tim Lincecum, Matt Cain, and Bumgarner as well. We'll get to that where the Rangers fall short of that in a second. But basically, this this is the commonality. These are the things that these teams have in common, and that's kind of how you establish yourself as a dynasty. The Rangers are not a dynasty now. They have won one championship. It was amazing. It was the greatest sports moment of my life. I loved it more than anything. But if they're trying to you know, set your expectations for dynasty, for multiple championships, for things like that. This is about where you have to look. There are no active dynasties in Major League Baseball right now. There aren't. There are some teams that are close that are trying to establish themselves as that. There are some that claim it, even though, you know, one or more of their championships may or may not be legitimate. I'm I'm not naming any specific names, but, you know, there are three main teams that are, are vying for that. Well, I guess if you include the Rangers, there, there's four that are vying for that dynasty title. It's the Dodgers, it's the Braves, it's the Astros, and, and now the Rangers. And each of those teams in the last five years has one championship. And they are all set up to compete for a long, long time. And they have been, well, three of those four teams, outside of the Rangers, the last five years, three of those four teams have been very very good. But the bar for establishing a dynasty, that is a a thing that gets thrown around too lightly. Making seven straight AOCSs is not a dynasty. Winning your division, you know, eight out of ten years, nine out of twelve years, however many however often you're winning your division, that does not matter. It is all about the championships with establishing a dynasty. The Rangers right now got the hardest one out of the way. They got one. Something they didn't do in 2010 or 2011 or 2012, all of which were teams that were good enough to win the World Series. I'd throw in 2015 and 16 as well as, as teams that were good enough to win the World Series. But they didn't. This was the first year that the Rangers won a championship. And they did it in year zero of their their contention cycle. This was much earlier than expected. You could see that by the Rangers not having the bullpen arms that you know a championship team would need, a, a real hodgepodge bullpen. And then the Rangers just you know lit the world on fire for the first two months, and you thought, oh, okay, this, this could be the team that opens up that window and continues to win and win and win. But how wide open is that window? And how many of these boxes are the Rangers checking for a team that is hoping to establish itself as a dynasty? We'll talk about all that and more right after this for our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Say goodbye to Busted Brackets, because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tourney. Whether you're betting on a big upset or a one seed, it is time to go dancing with America's number one sportsbook. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. That's $200 to use on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who is going to win it all. I don't know about you, but my bucket, my bracket is busted absolutely busted but hey with FanDuel you still get to get in on the action whether your bracket is in first place of your group or the last place of your group and you're gonna have to sustain some kind of punishment like I will for deeply failing in your bracket FanDuel lets you get in get some skin in the game no matter what your picks were earlier just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets 
Shout out to the Everydayers for making Lockdown Raiders your first listen every single day. I'll be back tonight on opening night, right after the game, live on YouTube, talking about opening day and how the Rangers look in their first game as the defending World Series champions. Now, what are the Rangers doing right to establish themselves as a dynasty? What of these different qualities of these very successful teams the last 20, 30 years have the Rangers repeated? Well, let's look at generational homegrown talent. Do the Rangers have one of those guys on their roster? Well, I think they just might. Wyatt Langford and Evan Carter are both so incredibly talented, so incredibly young, and both have such incredibly bright futures. Wyatt Langford has yet to play a game in the big leagues, and so already deeming him a generational superstar is probably a bit premature on my part. But Evan Carter is already looking the part, and even if only one of them, maybe both of them, if only one of them turns out to be a generational star, or just multi-time all-star, it doesn't even have to be a guy who wins, you know, five MVPs, turns into Barry Bonds. I I don't think either of these guys are going to put up, you know, 760, however many career home runs. That's, That's probably a little bit too much to ask for kids who have played a combined what, 50 games in the big leagues regular season and, and postseason combined? Not not even 50. So that's probably a bit too much to ask. But the makings are there. You don't have to squint too hard to see, okay, okay, these two kids are absolutely sensational and could be, you know, that homegrown star. And if it's not them, then maybe it's Josh Young who made an all-star team his rookie year and looks sensational. Or maybe it's a guy coming down the pipeline way years down the road in Sebastian Walcott. Eh, you probably have to squint a little bit more at that one. But those top two in Wyatt Langford and Evan Carter already looking to be superstars in year one. So check that homegrown talent off your checkbox. Now, let's look at the other ones. Nail the big signings. Well, that, that's a big old check rooney from the biggest two signings that the Rangers have made in their history. Well, the two big, biggest position player free agent signing. Well, well, the two most recent ones that they have nailed the best. Marcus Simeon, Corey Seager. That's a check. That's a big old check for both of them. Not only the big checks that they got, but a big check on them being what the Rangers expected, living up to the hype, living up to their paycheck, exceeding the value on their contract, and bringing the Texas Rangers their first ever championship, a World Series MVP, number two and three in AL All-Star or AL MVP voting in their second year in Texas. Both All-Stars, both Silver Sluggers, both absolute studs, both here for the long term. And I don't see either one of them falling off anytime soon. And, and even if they do, the Rangers nailed those big signings. The other big signing that they had, Jacob DeGrom. Well, that hasn't really worked out yet in the Rangers' favor. It It still could. It still could. It's not already immediately an abject failure of a signing because it can't be because the Rangers won the World Series. That's that's how that works. That signing cannot be an abject failure. But if the Rangers do eventually get a healthy DeGrom this year in August and then a reasonably healthy DeGrom for the next three years of the contract, so a healthy DeGrom for, what, 600, 650 innings? And if the Rangers win multiple championships with him in a five-year contract window, that is still a successful deal. You look at the other big moves, the big trades the Rangers made, trade for Jordan Montgomery at midseason this year, that's a big old win for the Rangers. The trade for Aroldis Chapman, well, Rangers are not loving how that looks now, but it got them a championship, so flags fly forever, so check plus. And then you look at the Max Scherzer deal. Depending on what Max Scherzer does this year during the regular season, that can look like an even bigger home run win. It's already a win, because Luis Angel Acuna is, is a fine prospect, and even if he turns into his brother, Rangers won a championship with Max Scherzer on the hill, and they don't get the playoffs without him. That is a big old check. So these these big moves, these big signings, these big old swings that the Rangers took, those have all worked out so far. So these are two big checks in the Rangers' cap. Now, all-time great manager. Well, that, that's that's a check. The Rangers already got one. <laughs> They've already got one of, if not the best managers in Major League his- history in Bruce Bochy. He already was that. He already was a first ballot Hall of Famer before he signed with the Rangers, got out of retirement, reset that Hall of Fame clock, and he's got three years on that contract. We'll see if he makes it all three of those years. I'm inclined to think that he does. 
whether he resigns afterwards, we'll see. We'll see what the deal is there. He's definitely going to be a guy who plays it by ear, and he won't know in, until he knows, but I'm pretty sure he's going to honor all three years of that contract. They at least have a second year of Bruce Bochy, so that's a big old check rooney for the Rangers. Now, the other things teams have to do when they are looking to establish a dynasty, you've got to win those moves on the fringes as well. Not only the big signings, not only the get lucky that your homegrown talent, eventually one of them turns into an absolute superstar, the Rangers have a, a bevy of young talent of just just these guys on the fringes that are sensational. That could be, you know, I hate to call Josh Young a guy on the fringe when he was an All Star as a rookie, but it kind of was. And he's not one of the three best players on the Rangers, but he's still very very good. I mean, that's your you know fourth or maybe fifth best position player. That's great. But these moves on the margins, which I think really set them up for this year and set them up for the long term. It's, it's these in-between moves, these these kind of, you know, bet-on-yourself trades, these these just under-the-radar moves that end up working very, very well in the Rangers' favor. And there's three guys that really exemplify this. There's Nathaniel Lowe, there's Jonah Heim, and there's Adolis Garcia. The Rangers got really, really, really lucky to get hits on all of those guys, all those guys being all-star caliber players. Lowe was a guy who was overlooked in in Tampa Bay, who Tampa Bay thought you know couldn't hit for power, couldn't hit lefties, and couldn't defend. Well, he's hit for a decent chunk of power, hit hit had a, a silver slugger year in 2022. He can defend because he got a cold glove last year, a well earned cold glove. And in 2022, maybe maybe he'll regress to not hitting lefties again. But in 2022, he hit the crap out of lefties. So. That was a major win for the Rangers and the players they gave up. They were all big lottery ticket guys, guys that were very, very low in the system, guys that were still very, very far away from the big leagues and and so far haven't turned out to be, you know, all-star guys that you feel really, really bad about giving up in that deal. At the time, it didn't seem like that much of an upgrade for me from Ronald Guzman, but my goodness, it's been a massive upgrade. Adolis Garcia, you got for cash considerations. Turns out to be a multi-time All-Star, an ALCS MVP, an absolute world-beating talent, and clearly one of the at least 10, maybe 5 best outfielders in Major League Baseball. Maybe 5 is pushing at this point, but at least one of the 10 best outfielders in Major League Baseball. He's a sensational talent that you got for, what, a $250,000 check to the Cardinals? Best $250,000 the Rangers have ever spent. And then Jonah Heim, you get from your rival the A's in a salary dump move, a, you know, bet on Chris Davis with the K to end up being, you know, better than he was in Oakland. That wasn't the case. You get off of Elvis Andrews's contract. You, you move on from a guy who was one of the faces of your franchise and you pay a little bit extra for Chris Davis. You take on a little bit extra money because the A's are cheap and they threw in this, this guy who was a decent defensive catcher and they didn't think could hit worth a lick. And he turns out to be an all-star and a gold glover, and a World Series champion in Jonah Heim. All three of these moves are moves that you can't really replicate again when you're in your contention window. The Rangers couldn't give Adolis Garcia what he was at that point when the Rangers got him. In 2021, the Rangers were terrible, and they, they needed a guy to come in and step in and, I mean, Earlier that year, they had DFA'd him. He cleared waivers. Everybody had a chance to get into Los Garcia in 2021 after the Rangers had already claimed him for 250K from the Cardinals. And nobody did. And the Rangers gave him a chance to play every single day because they had an opening in their outfield. And he seized that job and he got better and better and better. He was an all star. He was what should have been a rookie of the year. He's been an elite defensive outfielder. And this year he ascended to absolute superstar. You can't really replicate that once the contention window is open. But thankfully, the Rangers lineup is so darn good. They don't really need to try that with him or with finding out if Nathaniel Lowe is actually an everyday player or finding out if Jonah Heim is an everyday player because they've already got those guys. And they've got those guys for the next three years as well as those young kids they've got for the next five years. And not to mention Corey Seager for the next eight years and Simeon for the next half decade. Those are the kind of things the Rangers have been doing incredibly well, incredibly well. But coming up 
what have they not been doing well to set themselves up and what would prevent them from establishing a dynasty just like they want? Talk about that right after this word from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Fire TV. Fire TV is your destination for sports. From live games to in-depth analysis and highlights, Fire TV offers amazing viewing experiences with smart TVs as well as the Fire Stick that plugs in directly into your existing TV, provides access to millions of movies and TV episodes as well as free and live TV. Whether it's the opening weekend for baseball or the college basketball tournament, you are going to want to have a Fire TV. Fire TV recently created Fire TV channels to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos for your favorite sports brands all for free. That includes us at Locked On and most of the big pro leagues and college conferences as well. Fire TV channels let you dive into all the game analysis, highlights, and more. And keep up to date in the latest in the world of sports. March Madness, NBA, MLB, and lots more. Not to mention great news, entertainment, gaming, travel, and cooking videos as well. Check out Fire TV channels on Fire TV and Alexa devices. If you haven't already, you got to trust me on this. To learn more, visit Amazon.com slash LockedOnFireTV. Now, what do the Rangers do need to do to improve on to become a dynasty? Well, what's the one thing the Rangers haven't done well in the last five years? Well... Let's say the last three years, because if, if you open it to five years, there, there were a lot of things that didn't go well um, until the last couple of years. But I think the main thing, if you ask Rangers fans who have been really in on this team for, for the last half decade, it's it's developing pitching, developing homegrown starting pitching, just developing pitching at all. The Rangers have, as a franchise have always had issues recruiting good pitchers, home growing good pitchers. And, and well, with a new stadium that isn't 112 billion degrees. It's it's much easier to sign starting pitchers, which the Rangers have done and did a lot before the 2023 season and signing, you know, Eovaldi and signing Jacob deGrom and signing Andrew Heaney and everybody else that they signed or acquired the last couple of years. It's, it's been better, but a free agent rotation an entirely, almost entirely free agent rotation is an expensive rotation. And it is usually an old rotation, which is the case for the Rangers as they start the year with three guys on the IL for probably at least about half the season. And those guys are pretty expensive and acquiring more talent, acquiring more starting pitching while you've got that many guys on the shelf is difficult when your owner is not Steve Cohen or George Steinbrenner or, um, Jerry Jones with an actual open wallet. But I digress. The Rangers, if they're going to establish themselves as a dynasty, the one thing that they haven't done that they really, really need to do is to develop homegrown starting pitching. Puts a lot of pressure on Jack Leiter and Kumar Rocker and Brock Porter and Owen White and every other starting pitcher in this Rangers farm system to come up and not necessarily be an ace because home growing an ace is incredibly difficult and you know the giants happened to home grow three aces which was nuts and that's kind of what led them in part uh, as well as having you know buster posey as well as having bruce bochy and his even year nonsense um all of that led to their dynasty and the rangers probably aren't going to home grow in an ace caliber pitcher but just home growing one is maybe even two maybe even two maybe i'm getting a little ahead of myself of just a number three starter in this rotation. Heck, two. No I'd settle for two number fours. I'd, I'd take that. And it's something the Rangers just really have not done in ages. It has been ages since they have done it. And there have been so many prospects that have come and gone, even on the hitting side. The one thing they've done really well is developing such a glut of young hitters. I mean, thinking about the five-year history of this podcast, now season number six, I mean, in the history of this podcast, if, if the Rangers at any point before, you know, last year had had Josh Young or Ezekiel Durant or Evan Carter or White Langford or Leo Tavares at any of those points, I'd have been like over the moon because that is so many good, young, cheap, controllable, homegrown players the Rangers have done a good job of. And it's what's allowed them to go out and spend a lot of money on starting pitching, which is an incredibly difficult thing to home grow. Or you got to make some smart trades and give up some assets that way and, and redistribute your assets that way, which 
might end up being a route that the Rangers go if they want to look at a trade with you know either the Marlins or the Brewers or whatever starting pitcher with years of control happens to be on the market. I think it could be something that the Rangers you know, look at to kind of keep that rotation budget in check. And there's also still going to be some big money free agents that are coming off the books after this year. It's going to be Max Scherzer coming off the books. Um, there's going to be Andrew Heaney coming off the books. Not as big a money as Scherzer, but right around what they're paying him. Uh, because the Mets are footing the bill for a large portion of Max Scherzer's salary this year. But there are some free agents that are still available, some free agent starting pitchers that are available next year. And that's the that's the big issue with this team for this year and for the next few years is who's going to start games for this Rangers squad? There's going to be a great lineup that is you know basically zero doubt, and every everyday player has at least you know two more seasons of club control after this one. Most of them have three or, or have four or five or six or one of them has eight and Corey Seager. But this lineup is going to be the same thing for the next few years. And that, that same thing is going to be really darn good and the backbone of this team. But one of the things that got this team to this point is, is not only being smart with these moves on the margins, not only, you know, getting lucky in the ways that they did in, in not having worse injuries to Corey Seager in having most of their, well, having Marcus Simeon being the pinnacle of health and, and getting Nate Eovaldi back healthy when the Rangers needed him most and and also getting some luck in the first ever draft lottery, giving them Wyatt Langford and picking fourth as opposed to whoever the heck would be there at the seventh pick. That That's some nice luck, some nice things to go your way. But the Rangers... The thing that really got them there in, in signing Seeger and Simeon and DeGrom and Eovaldi and just being aggressive on the market, that was the market inefficiency that the Rangers exploited. You got to have something in your bag if, if you are one of those teams of just being so much better than everyone else at a certain thing. And when ownership groups were being incredibly cheap and, and not willing to give Corey Seager this massive deal and and not willing to give Marcus Simeon a seventh year on the deal or or not willing to go five years on Jake DeGrom, the Rangers said, okay, we'll do that. We'll do that because, yeah, it might bite us on the back end. Yeah, eventually this might end up looking bad, but the Rangers put themselves in a position financially to be able to afford a couple of bad contracts in, in later years. They had that base level of talent of the Durans and the Youngs and the Lowe's and the Himes and the Garcias and the Tavares as well. Not to mention whatever they would get eventually from Evan Carter. And they didn't even foresee Wyatt Langford at the start of this contention cycle. But they need to embrace that. They cannot get away from it. And I'm, I'm hoping that this cheapness with the TV situation doesn't end up ruining what could be a long potential run and I think that you know adding Jordan Montgomery if the Rangers had done that on a you know four or five year deal or whatever it ended up being if they felt comfortable with that with the Bally situation then I think that would really shore up some of the need for Jack Leiter or Owen White or Kumar Rocker or Brock Porter to come up and and be pretty darn good and yeah it would keep the Rangers in the higher end of the payroll but again not much would be changing from year to year there wouldn't be a whole lot of variance of, oh, well, the Rangers need to go you know add this many starting pitchers. If, if they had that core of, of what they have, and then eventually the young guns come up and, and help out, this is a team that is definitely built to sustain their contention window, to keep winning for a long, long time, because not only is this lineup incredibly good, it's, it's still very young. These guys are still in their prime. I mean, the old guy on this team, the old guy, is Marcus Simeon, who's going to be 33, and... I feel pretty confident in the way that he's going to age. Josh Young is 26 this year. Nathaniel Lowe, 28. Jonah Heim, still not 30 yet. Corey Seager, turning 30 this year. Not to mention your 21 and 22-year-old outfielders that are going to be um, hopefully sensational. But again, those guys are... You're not even really relying on them to be you know the main crux of your offense because the main crux of your offense is literally everybody and also Corey Seager. This team is not just winning now. They won year zero of their contention cycle, and and they didn't even have Jacob deGrom. They didn't have Jacob deGrom or fully healthy Max Scherzer. And come playoff time this year, the Rangers might have both, or they might have neither. And even if they have neither, this team is set up to contend for a long, long time. 
dynasties are difficult. And the other thing that this Rangers team needs to have is, is not only staying lucky, but staying aggressive and, and keeping that mentality of, you know, we don't want to get complacent. We don't want to win just one. We want to win a dynasty. We want to have a dynasty. We want to win every single year for the next 30 years until we all turn to dust. That's the mentality that I think a lot of this team has, that the front office has, that obviously Bruce Bochy has. And, and Bochy knows how difficult it is to go back to back. Sometimes you just get unlucky. Sometimes your you know, Hall of Fame catcher gets slid into and his leg broken and he's out for the year and everything else goes to crap. Sometimes your homegrown starting pitchers eventually get old and your window shrivels up that way. But this team is, is built different. They are built to want to win over and over and over again. They are so incredibly businesslike. And I think the biggest the biggest show of why the Rangers are like that, the biggest show of, of how they are like that is, is Evan Carter's quote right after the Rangers won the World Series that, that still makes me laugh. He was just doing this little social media hit for the Rangers social media right after the Rangers won the championship. And he looks into the camera, and it's like about six seconds, and he's like, job's not done, Rangers fans. J- job's not done. We want to win more. We want to, you know, keep on winning. And it made me laugh so incredibly hard because for me as a fan, it's one win. This was all I ever wanted. This is a lot of your sports dreams as well. It's just, just win one. But from the players... I'm very glad they have a very different mentality of me. No, one is not enough. Three is not enough. I want a bazillion championships. And that's how this team is built. They are built to become a dynasty. They won in year one. This contention window hopefully will be open for a long time. Maybe it won't. But just sitting here thinking about a potential dynasty, given where we were last year, gosh, I really, really love opening day and the optimism that brings because... Wow, what a different place the Rangers and Rangers fans are from just 365 days ago. That's going to do it for today's show. Thank you all so much. And until next time, don't forget to enjoy World Series champion, potential dynasty, Texas Rangers baseball.